Making indie films is hard work. Getting people to come watch them is even harder. And you're going to find out all about it on this episode of The Mythwits, the show dedicated to all things geek pop culture, drenched in absurdity and coated with sarcasm. Every week we bring on an industry guest to talk about the ever-expanding Geekiverse and to play a game with us. We do our damnedest to be funny, but there are no guarantees. I'm your host, Peter Bryant, and joining me this week is my co-host, Mike Kafis. I guarantee you're going to laugh, either at us or with us. Sure. My other co-host, Steve Wallet. Hello, everybody. I'm already laughing at Mike. Okay. <laughs> and our guest this week is Sophie Max. Hi, everyone. I'm super excited to be here. Excellent. Sophie is an actress and writer who grew up in London and moved to New York to study at the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. Film TV work includes Rock Island. It's Rock with two Ks. That's Rock Island and uh, and Health Nut Forever. Theater includes Upstand. Ups, upstand is it Upstander by Stander. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Okay, Upstander by Stander. Uh, yeah. At the New York Frigid Festival and Nowhere Man at Theater for the New York City. As a writer, she won the Wicked Young Writers Award in the UK in 2012. And her book, Lost and Found, is now available on Amazon Worldwide. Callie, her film being produced by Cinemascape Studios, is a story which uh, is extremely close to her heart and which she is thrilled to be making with an extraordinary team, which includes so many female artists from around the world. Fantastic. Welcome to the show, Sophie. Welcome. So, you know, I, I had in my notes all this stuff about uh, about all the, the acting and, and uh, movie work that you're doing. And I just, for some reason, skipped all in your bio, skipped all over about your book. Um, let me let me hit that real quick before we get into the movie stuff, because that's sort of like a, that's something that's not uh, like like in line with the other stuff we're talking about. So before I forget, you know, we don't come back to it. What what is this book? This wicked young writer? I'm sorry uh, for your book. Uh, Lost and found. Lost and found. Sorry, sorry. Yes, sorry. I'm sorry. Lost um, and found. So Lost and Found is a volume of poetry that I published. Um, it was released on the 9th of January this year, so it's pretty new. Um, I published it after having worked on it for probably maybe half a year. Um, it's a lot of very personal poetry that I wrote um, about a bunch of different topics. It's, you know, it's about love and life and growing up and finding yourself and, and dealing with um, a lot of different challenges and, and with being a woman in the world today. Right. Um, and you know, it was something that I was extremely, I'm, I still am extremely proud of. And, you know, I've been getting a lot of incredible responses since it was released, which is amazing. Um, you know, I've had um, so many women and young girls approach me um, or, you know, message me, contact me, telling me how the book resonated with them. Um, I recently even had a woman who's a social worker tell me that she's going to purchase the book for some of the young women that she works with who are dealing with sexual assault mm -hmm. um, because she thinks that the, the part of the book that, that deals with that will really help them, which, you know, I just got told that like the other day. So it was, you know, something that really, really touched me, but I'm just really so proud of the book and of how people are resonating with it. So I'm super excited about that. Excellent. All right. Fantastic. Fantastic. All right. And then I'll have to make sure, don't let me forget, I got a little note here because I, I don't have a link for that. You didn't give me a link for that. Make sure we get a link for that. I mean, is, is it just something they could look up on Amazon or? Yeah, uh, I can send okay. you the link like right now. Okay. That's fine. If you, if you email it to me, I'll catch it. Yeah, I'll email it to you. Sure. Okay. All right. Um, All right. So while yeah. you're doing, okay, that's fine. So while you're doing that, then, then I'll tell you what, I'll jump ahead once, one little bit here. Uh, while you're doing that, Steve, uh, Steve is an independent filmmaker. Uh, he's been on the show before and talked about his, his, uh, movie, uh, a word from a gamer. And, um, so Steve, uh, what's, what's the update on that? What's going on with that? Well, as of today, we've submitted to 33 film festivals. We haven't been accepted in any, but it's early. The, most of the uh, most of the festivals make their announcements later in the year, so we're just waiting to see what happens there. Um, I'm feeling really positive about things. I have a offer from a gentleman that works with the Learning Channel, and he is hopeful to get the uh, 
film on the Learning Channel, which would be really cool. Oh, that would be cool. That would be fantastic. Yeah, it, and uh, Steve, we're all having a debate here in the uh, in the chat room because everyone uh, says that uh, staring at you is like staring into the face of God with your aura behind your head. So, uh, <laughs> just just know that you you your uh, your expert filmmaking has uh, you know has really the lighting that you've you've provided us today. Is, uh, it's an effect well, I, he's going for. It's infectious. It is. It is the lighting or the sound. And you guys didn't like the thundering sound the last time I spoke with you. You know what? I'll take good sound over, over, over great lighting. Because the lighting is acceptable. Bad sound is just bad all around. The, this is what I get when I use my wife's office. Okay. Yeah. Right, well, it works. No one should be staring directly into uh, Steve's face anyway. So <laughs> That's fine. All right. So let's get back to our guest, Sophie. Um, <laughs> God, these guys. All right. So, so let, let's talk about um, – Let's talk about movie making here. Let's let's say uh, to give people a little bit of a background of you know because we're we're going to get into the, the roles that people uh, have in in creating a movie and, and what you know what goes on during this. But what are those roles? I mean, what what roles do the different people play in movie making? Like um, you know, you have writers and actors and producers and directors. Um, let's let's start with when, with the writer. So does. Is the writer the starter of this whole process, or does someone else start this process? Like, like do you write a movie first and then go try and get it made, or or does somebody say, I'd like to make a movie about this and gets a writer? How, how does that work? I mean, um, it kind of works both of those ways depending on, on the project. Um, I know that sometimes you get, um, you know, studios or producers that will want to make a certain movie or you know make a movie that's based on a certain book and will then hire someone to write it um but in my case i i wrote and then found um a producer who was who was interested in in partnering with me in in making the movie um so it definitely works both ways okay so it could start from either end mm -hmm. But it never starts with the actors, right? I mean, never like I got this actor. I, I want to do something with him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's what I do. It's what I mean. I'm an actor, so right. um, you know, when I'm writing or when I'm starting a project, I start from you know what I want to do as an actor, like what right. what roles I want to play. So normally it doesn't start with the actor, but for me it does. Oh okay. <laughs> hi, oh hi, Mark. Oh, hi, Mark. So, yeah, we had – so if you've seen The Room, right? The, yes. the movie The Room? Okay. So we – our first episode this year, we had uh, Kyle Vogt on, and he was one of the actors in the oh, original wow. movie In The yeah. Room. And uh, we did a little <laughs> – so now The Room has become one of our official memes. You know, oh, yeah. oh hi, Mike. Oh, hi, Mark. <laughs> All right. It's great. Oh, Lisa. Right. And we so, – I sat clearly. through that whole thing, yeah. and I made Mike sit through it too, the original. <laughs> Oh. And then we went and watched The Disaster Artist the day that we interviewed uh, Kyle. It was great. It was really good timing. It made it all worth it. It really made it. It's like once you see The Disaster Artist, you go, oh, that, that wasn't so bad. <laughs> <laughs> we were just looking at it wrong. All right. So so anyway, so what does the – and Steve, I want you to chime in on this one too after Sophie gets her, gets a, a, a crack at it. Um, the – from your experience, where how does the producer plan all this? Because that's always the most confusing thing for me. What role does the producer? I mean, like, what do they do? Um, I mean, in the end, the producer is, you know, in control of the money and therefore gets the final say on everything. Okay. Um, you know, they're not always there for the for the shooting process. Um. And, you know, not always on set with you, but, um, you know, they get, they get a lot of, a lot of credit and, you know, they do a lot of work in, in the pre-production and then also in the, in the funding and, um, kind of getting it out to other funders. I know my producer, Anthony, um, has, you know, brought a bunch of other amazing producers on board and been really working really hard to, um, like in the pre-production process, um, but yeah, they do basically get the final say on on everything because they are in control of the money. <laughs> yeah. Can, can I mean, before, Steve, before you chime in, let me just, I wanted to say that uh, what I've heard, and I have one directorial credit at uh, the RIT, Rochester Institute of Technology, for an educational video. But uh, 
that the the producer is like the parent and they're the final thing when the when everything's going great you should never see the producer and yeah. when there's a problem that's who you have to go to they're the they they're like exactly. the parent. They, they settle the arguments and they make whatever needs to be resolved yeah. resolved yeah okay for sure okay and it's steve you you've got a lot of producer credits i mean is that just because you have you backed a lot of stuff have you had input on this stuff I've had input on a number of them. Uh, I've written pieces for a number of films, but it's mostly listening to the other person's script and saying, hey, wouldn't it be better to do it this way? And because I'm the producer, they make those little changes. But for the most part, as a producer, I've had very little impact on the films. I mainly put money behind the films that I believed in and made them come to life. Okay, because it would seem to me from what I'm hearing here is that, you know, if a, if a movie tanks, let's say a movie tanks, right? It's it's uh, rarely the writer who gets blamed, but they do get blamed. It can be the writer, but it's it's kind of rare. Uh, it seems that the actors can catch a lot of blame for it, but it seems that the director really catches the 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 butt end of that stick. I mean, they usually they're the ones that's like if a movie tanks, it's always the directors. But I never ever hear the producers getting uh, getting in trouble for a movie not doing well. I mean, not may, maybe behind the scenes, of course, uh, but never like up front. You never hear them say, oh, this movie was horrible because the producers they stepped in and they ruined it. Uh, and it seems like they never get credit for it either. Like if a movie's really great, you never hear about, oh yeah, well the producer made this really great suggestion and it made the movie everything, you know? So it seems like they're kind of almost invisible uh invisible to the credit and invisible to the to the the you know the blame yeah i, I mean... agree <laughs> go ahead <laughs> sorry yeah no for sure i mean yeah they're very much kind of behind the scenes whereas the director is right there behind the camera the director's the one with the vision and with the you know advising the actors what to do so yeah right I mean, it seems to me, from what I've heard, stories I've heard about Star Wars, A New Hope, the, the first one that came out in 77, that um, that it was really the producer that saved that movie. Like, there was a whole, like there was this final cut, and the producer, or producers, I don't know how many of them it was, they, they made changes, and they said that those changes actually saved that movie and made it what it is today, that, that A New Hope wouldn't be as good as it is. And Star Wars may not have taken off if they, if they hadn't gone in and, and made some critical tweaks. That's what I've heard. But, all right, so um, so let's let's talk. The, okay, now that we have, we know our roles here, because we all know what the director does. I mean, that's that's a question nobody has to ask, or, or the actors. I mean, we know what they do. Uh, but what is what is the process of getting a film made? Like, all right, so, so we've established the money comes from the producers. They're the ones that put their money in. So even if a director puts money in, he he's then becomes also a producer because that's that he's playing both of those roles, I guess, at that point. Um, but but how much? How much does it cost to like, like for example, uh, Callie? What kind of budget are you working on with Callie? Like, what, what kind of budget was that? Um. Well, I mean, we haven't actually shot the movie yet, oh, okay. um, and obviously, I'm not very much in control of the budget. But um, we don't have a very big budget. Um, it's luckily I'm working with great people who actually have a lot of their own equipment already, which okay. is you know a lot of a lot of the money would be going towards stuff like right. equipment, which, you know, isn't a cost that, that we, that we have. Um, so it is definitely possible to make things with, you know, not a million dollar budget, right. um, which is great, but, um, yeah, we, you know, there's, there's always costs incurred in, in the various stages of, of making a film from, you know, the pre-production stuff to locations, to equipment, costume, then entering it for film festivals later on, post-production. Right. Yeah, so there are definitely costs involved. Oh, yeah. You know, I know. I know. I mean, um, so to, to Steve, when... Um when when you've produced been a producer on some of these um like you worked with a lot of indie films that's why you know it's good to have you on here because you know uh, a lot of the shorts and indie films and stuff uh, what, what do you see a lot of times for budget like what, what are people asking for just to get an idea uh, i'm just trying to get a ballpark okay for many of the shorts we that i've worked with was under a five thousand dollar budget and that's okay. assuming they had their own equipment to start with Right. Um, when you start getting into feature length films uh the sky's the limit Mil i mean yeah millions right yeah <laughs> right 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 Okay. 
All right, and then um, and what what do you what do you think the the biggest cost would be at least for an indie film? It would be your equipment, right? Because a lot of the the actors and stuff, um, I would imagine a lot of them work for you know nothing or or very little, right? Because uh, it's it's sort of like a labor of love. Because I mean, like a short, it's not like you're going to put it in the movie theaters and you know make millions of dollars off of it. It's 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 um, uh, sort of like a showcase piece, right? Yeah, well, with a word from a gamer, uh, it was almost our entire budget was blown on editing. Right. Okay. Okay. And what about what about you, Sophie? Where do you find uh, a lot of that money goes to? In your case, with the stuff you've worked with. Um. I mean, I don't know what the the main kind of money is because again, I've worked a lot with people who have their own equipment and. I see. Okay have their own like editing software and stuff so that that wasn't really a cost incurred so mainly really festivals um right. and some post-production post-production right. you don't think that it would that it would cost but it really does right i imagine do you edit can you edit video at all do you know how do you do you do any of that i really don't um my brother does my brother's wonderful at it but okay. um i've never been very tech savvy <laughs> so right. yeah I just about know how to work my Google Hangouts. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah. Hey, it's it was, it's tough. It was, only recent. it was only recent that I learned how to work my Google Hangout. Um, and I, so no, I'm, I'm not really tech savvy enough to have my um, to be good at editing. Right, because I I you know I have to do editing for this show sometimes, and and like as much as I've I've done. I wouldn't consider myself like good at it. You know, I'm, I'm okay. I can pass, I can get it done, but I guarantee you I'm not doing it efficiently. <laughs> you know, I guarantee that, that the time I spend on it is probably two to three times what a professional would spend on it e easily, if not more, you know? And if, if somebody was sitting on my shoulder who did this every day, they'd be like, why are, why are you doing it that way? I'm like, uh, cause I don't know any other way. Leave me alone. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> right. You know, it would kill to have someone over your shoulder. Teach yeah. me. Teach me, show me, show me. All right, so okay, so let's let's uh, let's move on to um, uh, ba ba ba. Let's move on because I got I got some other questions, but I'm I'm kind of like eh. Uh, let, let's talk about female filmmakers. So one of the things I know you're very interested in is, is the role and, and issues that that are that some of the female filmmakers. And when I say filmmakers, I'm talking about anybody in the industry getting a film made, right? I mean that's what we're talking about. Could be could be actors, could be producers, directors. What are some of the unique challenges that, that they face that that would be different than say you're? And I know it's all I'm, it's all it's general. I know not everybody faces this, but what in general do do uh, women tend to face? as issues uh, uh, that men may not? I mean, I think historically, as in any industry, it's a very male dominated industry because it wasn't that long ago that women were not allowed to have jobs. Right. So um, I think breaking into that is difficult and you know, not being trusted in a way to, to be able to, to do as do the jobs as well as men would or that people are even interested in women's stories. I think now we're finally seeing these, you know, these huge box office hits written or directed by women and people are starting to realize like, Oh, there's a big market for this. But, um, you know, there's still plenty of people who would say that there's no need for these stories to be told or no one's interested. Um, and therefore just wouldn't, you know, trust women with that, whereas they would, you know, trust a man who's had a lot more opportunities because historically he was able to, right. you know, that's, we're, we're now, it's the 90th Oscars and we're having our first female cinematographer ever nominated. Mm. Hmm. This first nominee. Right. We're also having the fifth female director ever to be nominated. The first right. in seven years. And if she wins, she'll be the second ever to have won. Uh, okay. I mean, that's, in, that's insane statistics to me. I mean, there have been 90 Oscars. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, well, I mean, you know, there's, that's aside from all the things that are now coming out about, you know, um, the way that women are treated in the industry by people in power, um, which is, you know, a whole rabbit hole, which, um, you know, I'm also hugely passionate about, but, but won't get into. Um, I mean... I think part of the problem really with, with women 
you know, with the with our roles uh, that, we, that women are given, and also, you know, with these stories, is that you don't have as many female writers, or, or the female writers don't have the opportunity to have their stories told, and. It's like, it's like Greta Gerwig said, she's like my biggest inspiration. I love Greta Gerwig. Uh, she's incredible. Um, it's like she said about Lady Bird, which is I think one of the most beautiful movies, where she said that she wanted to tell female stories without contextualizing it as a male story first. Right. Which I think is really important to me as well. And that's what, I, that's what I do with all my writing. And that's what I do with Callie is, you know, not telling like not just seeing a woman through the eyes of a man, right? but telling her story in her own right and from her own point of view. Because I think how people are viewed is different to how they actually experience the world. And, you know, how I experience the world as a young woman is probably different to how, you know, a 50 year old man writing a young female character would, would think that that character experiences the world. You think? You think? <laughs> just because, right. you know, people, you don't know these things. Um, right. And so, you know, that was, that was what I'm really passionate about writing. And also the roles that I'm really passionate about playing are, you know, real people and not these kind of ideas of people that, that like is how people think they are. Um, and that's, that's what I wrote with Cal with Callie. And that's what I, you know, was, was one of the first things that I was really passionate about and that I thought made the story really special was that it's the story of these two very real, very complex modern young women and their friendship from their own point of view. There isn't any kind of lens on it. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I'm a young woman and I'm writing about young women right. um and i think that's something that's really important in getting a wider variety of stories out there so i'm assuming i'm just gonna make this assumption i'm, I'm, I'm gonna assume that it passes the bechtel test <laughs> oh yeah yeah no i know i know of course it does there are two uh, characters in the film <laughs> they're right. both so, women right and they're not talking about a guy so what's what's funny um is that you know and and i I'll, i can't speak for anyone else but for me you know I never think about whether, you know, whether a, a woman directed or wrote or whatever, and, and maybe that's, you know, maybe that's good and bad in some ways, but like, if you were to tell me that, that, that a woman wrote a movie, I'd be like, oh, okay. You know what I mean? And I think that's the, the, you know, some of the, the problem with uh, not, you know, if they, like you're saying, not trusting women to do certain things. It's like, you know, you know nobody's going to go, oh, a woman wrote this, so I'm not going to go watch the movie. You know, I, I, I can't imagine. I mean, I guess I can't say no one. All right. So there are people that would. But, I mean, I don't know. I just, I think the most people wouldn't care. You know, they'd be would, like, okay, great. Would you say that you feel like maybe you're in, because I, I think I understand what you're saying, is like you feel like you're in a um, ignorant minority. I mean, ignorant majority of people who just think and assume there should be and you you assume that there is more of a balance in yeah. just the male and female roles all throughout the filmmaking process and it's just like why would i even question that right, right. i mean which so, is right. which is that's what i'm saying there there's good to that because that's how people kind of should think but then the bad to it is is that then people it's don't ask true. that question right. and it doesn't and, get yeah. called out so it's good and bad it's like it's, it's great that you think that way but at the same time we need to make sure that we we realize yeah. that it, that it's not that way i mean i think it's it's great because it it suggests that there's people in the world who you know don't you know don't aren't going to be judgmental about these things but I mean, not asking those questions has its own dangers because there's, I mean, there's that issue in every industry. I work for um, a nonprofit called I Am That Girl and recently I was doing research for them and um, in account over just a couple of years ago that um, basically 5% of the Fortune 500 company CEOs are women. Mm. Right. Five percent. Yeah, it's sad. As a statistic, there's you know, there's statistics in every industry and it's not till you hear the the statistics that you're like, Oh wow, okay. That's much more of an issue than even I thought it it's, was. It's maddening. It it, yeah. it shouldn't be that way and then 
And then, of course, then there's that once you find out, like, I, I feel like for someone like me, it's like, well, you know, what can I do? <laughs> you know what I mean? It's like I, I would support where do I where can I throw what 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 little money I would even have at whoever would help make that change or what can I do with what little time I have to help make that change? But short of that, I mean, yeah. I'm not yeah. sure. I think that links me to one of my favorite quotes ever, which I think it's kind of pretty pertinent to this situation, which um, is don't be a voice for the voiceless, pass mm -hmm. the mic. Yeah. Okay. And I think right. that's, that's all there is to, to do, Fantastic. honestly, is to pass the, pass the mic and let people, you know, tell those stories. And that goes for everyone who's, who's, you know, been silenced and not, and not represented and mm -hmm. not trusted with those, with those stories. Lost the mic. Okay. That's Fantastic. I That's what you do. Hey, we got um, we got a couple questions. Hold on, I want to I want to get to these questions because we have we do have a live chat room going on and people are watching and they're asking questions, which is oh, great. Uh, I love the interaction. I, I've been waiting for the right time to break in because right, uh, Jonathan was asking about licensing um, for either music and or um, what else? It was licensing for music and. Uh, I guess playing music and, and other types of licensing like that, how much does that impact like a, a budget for a film on, on the indie level? I mean, for me, um, I'm very lucky to have um, a composer composing all original music for, um, for my project, which means that that's, you know, not, not so much an issue. I guess it is if, if you're using people's music, you have to get permission and license it. Yeah. Yeah, well, so, Steve, you you managed to uh, you managed to, to to get some stuff, right? I mean, did you? How, what did you yeah. find like for your film? Well, it depends on what you're using. I mean, if you're using something like uh, ACDC, you're going to have to go out and convince them to license the music in your film. And a lot of times, those licenses can be very complex as far as exactly what you're allowed to do. Uh, for most of the films that I've worked on, we went with original scores. We made the scores ourselves, or we had a composer make the score. Some of the time, the directors made the score. I mean, it's pretty cool, you know? It, it all comes down to what you're working with. Also, there's some really cool resources online for getting uh, free music. There are many people that are making music that want their stuff to get out yeah. there, and they'll just give it to you. All creative you commons. Credit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Creative commons, and also a lot of uh, stock footage and stock music that you yeah. can just buy that's cheap. Well, like, like for example, the music in this show I paid for, but I, you know, uh, I, I bought the right. But like, I think I think one of them was like twenty five dollars, and I'm allowed to use it all I want, so long as you know I don't try and take credit for it myself, and um, yeah. and and I don't resell it. Like, I can't like then turn around and resell that music to someone else. But I have what they call end user rights, and I can use it for this show, and it's not a problem. I'm not breaking any rules. I got um, really lucky with a uh, word from a gamer because. Uh, a award-winning composer wanted to be part of the film so he just came on board you know nice. Simone Cilio and this guy has won so many awards it's insane I couldn't believe he wanted to do it excellent I so at a lower level it's like hey you want to be in a movie uh, yeah, you know, <laughs> give me your music. <laughs> so, Sophie, I, I wanted to say, you know, uh, uh, I was trying to think of this before I went to the guest room and, and, it, and it kind of blanked out. So I was like, I'll go to the guest room and come back when it comes back to me. But I was going to say that, that this is a ex very exciting time, I think, uh, for anyone, uh, the women or minorities or, or just people who uh, – don't you know don't travel in the right circles you know because there are they're gatekeepers um that there are no gatekeepers anymore i mean I, I mean there are for like the big giant budget films and such but it has never been a better time to be a creator i think for anyone right wouldn't you say for sure yeah i'm i'm super excited to be you know living and, and working in this industry at this time i think it's a really exciting time filled with a lot of change, a lot of new creativity, a lot of excitement about, you know, new faces and new creativity and, and new projects um, being out there. And I mean, especially being in New York, um, there's, you know, there's so many people everywhere that I'm meeting in, in all different industries who are just doing amazing things and creating amazing work. Um, and, you know, I'm super excited that um, Callie gets to, 
know, bring a load of people like that together. I mean, we have the most incredible team. I'm also very proud to say we now have a female producer, director, DP, and composer of our original score, as well as two female actresses playing the lead roles. So we're championing those women in film. Um, oh, fantastic. But, you know, these are, you know, you know new, um, new people, new faces, new talents who are all so amazing and have such incredible vision. And I'm so excited that I get to partner with all of them and, you know, make this incredible project that we all feel so passionately about and make it happen with a team of people who are, you know, equally passionate and so amazing and so, you know, just give them that opportunity and, and give, um, like, get that story told and give these people voices and um, have that vision, like, up on screen. So what what does uh, where does Cinemascape Studios come in, come into play? How do, what is their role in, in all of this? Because I know I was talking to Anthony um, prior to the show, and he couldn't make it tonight. He was he was supposed to be on, but but where where do they fall into the, the role in this? Like, what are they doing? So they are producing the film. Um, okay. Anthony Anthony is one of our amazing producers. He was um, I worked with him before on Help Not Forever and. Um, you know, had an incredible time. I've seen a lot of his, his past work and, you know, he's so professional and it's such a good caliber um, quality of work that um, when I was, you know, sending my script out and trying to get it, trying to get it out there and trying to get it made, he was one of the first people that I went to. And I said, you know, I've got this, this script that I've written and, you know, how would, how would you be interested in, in producing it? And, he he loved it and said that he would um he'd like to to work with me on that so you know he's been he's been getting getting an incredible team together he's producing it um he's brought on a lot of other incredible producers and you know we're really partnering um on this to to get the the vision and the tone um perfect okay and and you you'd mentioned in the show notes that there was a story behind the script how it came about yeah, um, I mean, this is a script that I actually wrote must be a, over a year and a half ago now. Um, and I, I will never forget how I got the idea for this story. Um, I was going to bed one night and suddenly the first three, scre the first three scenes, I saw them. Mm -hmm. like a movie playing like in my head. I just saw the first three scenes. I jumped out of bed and wrote it down immediately because I knew I was like, oh my God, this is, this is something special. This isn't just any idea. This is something. I don't know what it is. But the script was basically written within, you know, a, a day or two. Mm -hmm. The entire script and very minimal changes have been made since then. Um... And, it, you know, it just totally flowed out of me. And it was something where I, I knew the characters before I'd even written them. And I loved them before I'd even written them. And um, I read the finished script, gave it to my, to my friend Faye, who's going to be playing um, opposite me as, as Jen in the movie. And I said, you know, I, I wrote this the past couple of days. What do you think? And she just fell in love with it. And she said, you know, Sophie, this is this is really good and right. I'd love to, to help make this happen in some way. And I knew that she was going to play Jen. I knew it. Um, right. And you know, since then I was just trying to, to make it happen and get it out there. And then I got busy with school and things and I'm so happy that we finally get to make this, you know, it's been so long in the making and it's, right. you know, definitely drawn from so many things. And I just knew as soon as, as soon as it happened, that it was, had the potential to be something really, really beautiful. Well, okay. <laughs> just oh, go ahead, Mike. I'm sorry. I, no, I go, go ahead, Pete. Go make your uh, comments. I was just, I was just gonna say, wait till you get to the editing portion of it, like oh. Steve just went through with his, and then you'll be like, "Holy crap! I'm done with looking at this thing." <laughs> right? Steve That's sends true. it to me. He says, "He says, he's like, I can't look at it anymore. Please look at this. <laughs> like, I can't look at it anymore." <laughs> You okay. watch the same scene 150 times. You're like, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So my, my question is, could you give us a little idea about where you are in the process of uh, making Callie and where, where, 
or when do you anticipate that coming to an end when we and how we will will we be able to see it sure um so we're currently kind of towards the end of the pre-production process um it's been going on since december really when when anthony you know said that he wanted to to help me help me make the film and we had an incredible table read an incredible rehearsal um and we're getting ready to shoot at the beginning of March is, okay. um, is when we're going to be shooting the movie and we're going to be, it's a short, so we're, so we're going to be wrapped by mid-March um, and then go into post-production for probably about a month. Um, we're planning on entering it for festivals, so sometime after the, after the festival process is, is over, we'll be able to share it with everyone else, um, which I'm super excited about because, you know, I just, I just love to see people. I love people's responses to, to, you know, things I've written, things I'm, I'm acting in. I'm just so, that's like one of the most special parts of the process for me is, is um, seeing how, how it resonates with people. So I'm super excited for that, but it's a little bit down the road. Right. So what went, give me an idea. When should I put in my calendar to bug you? to see, well, hey, when can we tell our fans like when they may want to go and, and watch this, have an opportunity? Sure. So um, can I bug you in like June, July? We're planning on um, the beginning of the fall. Okay. So, that, so like September, August, September. You could start bugging me in August. All right, all right. <laughs> I'm, I'm putting it down right now in August. I'm making a note to bug you in August. Yeah, cause, Great. Cause, well, cause once you've, once you've been on the show, you know, we try to continue to promote you if we see what you're doing. It helps, it helps when you all get back to us, but we keep an eye, I keep an eye out, you know, like Steve will post something and I'll share it on our page, you know, and, or, or, yeah. you know, I just, Andre, uh, one of the guys on our show, he posted something and I dumped it on our page as quick as I could. Yeah. Uh, so I, I try to continue to support any guests that's been on the show. Cause, well, cause yeah, you're like, definitely, once you're here, um, you're like family. Updated. Okay. Fantastic. Yeah. All right, so we're, we're coming up on time a little bit. We're getting close, uh, and I want to make sure I touch on the two other things that you want to talk about before we, before we go into the game. Um, the, uh, you mentioned talking about international artists. Yes. Um, I am not from the U.S. Right. You're no. From no. <laughs> um, um, that's, that's another thing that I'm, you know, really passionate about. I mean, you know, I'm not from here, and a lot of my – my friends are, are not from here and just, you know, being able to, to partner together with, we have such an international team on this movie. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm British. My co-star Faye is Greek. Um, our incredible composer Karia is um, from Istanbul, Turkey. So, um, you know, we have a really incredible international team going on which is um amazing and super exciting and you know all bringing wonderful things and i think should also you know have opportunities to to create and make work in this country because why the hell not right yeah yeah absolutely good at it. so you know I'm, I'm melting pot you know it seems to me that that uh, English folks are taking a lot of American jobs away. You know, I'm watching these movies. Oh, I'm watching these. No, no, it's, it's, I'm joking. Come on, I'm joking. I'm watching these movies, and you know, the person sounds sounds American, right? You know, sounds you know, sounds like one of us. And then you, they're doing an interview. He's like, so the other day I was saying, I was like, no, 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 stop taking American jobs. God damn it. <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But it's it's funny. <laughs> Because you don't see that a whole lot the other way. Like it seems like it's almost a little gauche for for an American to uh, to do like a British accent, even if they do it well. It seems like it's a little. I don't, you just don't see it as much. I don't, I don't know if it's is it a is it a, a social thing that it just kind of just doesn't happen that much. Or, or well, you're you're from over there, so tell me, do, do you do you ever get Americans over there? Yeah, sometimes. But playing like British seen, roles. Yeah, I've seen. Oh, wow. um, I remember I, I saw Elle Fanning play um, a British character in a movie once. Um, Anne Hathaway, she's always okay. over there. Yeah, sure, all right. Yeah. Hathaway, always playing those British roles. Um, yeah, there's def there's definitely some, and I think you know it's a it's a very different industry, but it's an equally rich industry that um, you know people love working in. I love working in. I I, I know you're biased. Oh, yeah, I, I know you're biased. Is it easier? 
in your opinion, though, from observationally, is it easier to do a British accent as an American or are Americans better or can Ooh. do British accents better? Or is it easier or is it, uh, I guess, it, uh, English people uh, are British people are better at doing American accents. What do you, where do you sit on that? I mean, I've just heard more British people do successful American accents than the other way around. I don't know yeah. why that is. Right. Well, I think that's a bias. That might be a... It's a potentially bias. bias, but, you know, in, in movies and stuff, I, I always seem to see British, pe British actors doing American accents very successfully, but mm. I've seen much less, mm. much less successful ones the other way around. I've seen plenty of movies where there's been an American actor doing a British accent. I'm sitting there like, ooh, that was yeah. just, didn't sound right. <laughs> yeah. It's amusing in its own way though. I love, yeah. I love doing that. I love like listening to my friends do British accents and stuff. Well, like the guy, the guy, what's, what's oh God damn, what's his name? The guy who plays House. Um, um, Hugh Laurie. Dr. Hugh House. Laurie. Hugh Laurie, yeah. Hugh Laurie. I was the first time, man. I was like, <laughs> what? <laughs> what? <laughs> I was like, come on. <laughs> yep. Like he gets yep. on there and he's he's as English as can be. And I'm just like, no, no. <laughs> he yeah. does a good job. He is a fan. He does an American accent really well. <laughs> Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, mm -hmm. he's good too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. All right. Uh, and the last thing, the last thing before we run out of time, Sophie, uh, tell me about the. Uh, you you want to talk about mental health awareness? Yes. Um, this is another huge theme in our movie. Um, that's. Something else I'm a I'm a huge advocate for, and I I like to you know be open and and talk about um, because you know it hurts much more to brush it under the rug than it does to talk about it. Right. Um. And you know because it's something I'm hugely passionate about, and because it's something that I don't think you even see that often in movies portrayed in a way that isn't damaging to, to the to the way people view mental health. Um, right. It was something I wanted to explore and, you know, that's, it's one of, I don't want to spoil the movie, but it's, it's one of the, um, one of the biggest themes in the film is how, um, you know, mental health and communication, I'd say, right. and how, how people, how people deal with, with mental health. It, it's interesting from my perspective uh, that, so my in my background so so when i grew up my i lived in a house i lived with my cousin he was sort of like my father uh he ran a, an assisted living from his house for mentally ill people and then they ran the gamut i mean some of them were, were a little bit ill and some of them were very ill uh you know the, the, hearing voices and talking to god the whole th i mean like really like like very very sick sometimes and it usually was like a cycle of their medicine like they would they'd be fine and then things would get out of whack and they get a little they get a little out there and have to go to the hospital for a little while till they calm down uh, to get adjusted. But at any rate, you know, so I have seen and lived with, lived lived in the house with uh, people with mental illness on all kinds of scales and stuff. And it's really interesting when I watch movies or talk to people how off they are about what you know what mental illness really is. You know, um, and, it's presented and how, as a caricature of itself instead yeah. of like what the true nature is. I think. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and, and it's and I, funny because you, you see autistic people like in movies, they're all superheroes or something, you know, like they're all, they've all got these superpowers like Rain Man or whatever. It's like, yeah, not, not so much, you know, it's, they have issues, but it, it's not, you know, you're, you're turning them into something they're not. I think creating a stigma around anything and creating a stereotype around anything is never good and is only to the detriment of people who, who deal with these things. And I think the entertainment industry has the power and the, you know, people view it enough to really change things. And, you know, that's why it's so exciting that it's, you know, so out in the open now talking about, about the role of women, but um, also in uh, topics such as mental health, I think the way that people are portrayed in, in movies and TV shows has the real power to influence how people think about people with, with mental health issues. Right. And, you know, and be at the forefront of, of that and you know, portraying them as real people rather than as some kind of stereotype could really help start much more healthy conversations. Yes. Oh, yeah. I think that they fail in their, their should have and should have an obligation to 
portray and educate in a more real and a more yeah. understandable interactive way and they don't and that's that's what i wanted to do with cali i mean i'm i don't claim to be speaking for everyone at all i don't i'm not the movie and the characters in the movie are not speaking for everyone with it with any kind of of mental health issue but i i just wanted to to show some real people dealing with things and struggling with things and trying to communicate um rather than any kind of stereotype of mm -hmm. you know a young woman with with a mental health issue that, right. I don't think that's helpful or healthy and you know as something i'm really passionate about i wanted to portray it in a very real way all right, okay. beginning of August. I'm going to bother you in the beginning of Sounds August. Sounds good. Just hurry up with this film already. I, I want to see it. <laughs> All right. Yeah, well, so we are we are up on time for the interview, and I, I absolutely want Sophia. I want to thank you for coming on. Uh, stick around. We're going to play a game. We're going to play a fun game. Uh, everybody, make sure you. Uh, I have a link for for IMDb in here, but it's this long thing with a bunch of like numbers and question marks and stuff. It's in the show notes already, and it will be in the show notes. Uh, make sure to check out the IMDb, IMDb link. Uh, you can find find you under Sophie Max. I'm sure there, right as well. Sorry. If I go to IMDb and I just search Sophie Max, yeah. I could yeah, absolutely yeah, okay. We'll find you there. And also while I while we're shouting out websites, yep. I will send you the link. We have an Indiegogo campaign going on right now to help us oh, fund okay. some of the some of the movie. So check that out. Donate if you can. It'll really help us make this project happen and you know champion those women in film. <laughs> right. Absolutely. So okay. That link over. And, and I am and dropping in the in the Facebook chat. I'm dropping your links now, and I'll drop it. Hopefully, I'll remember to drop it before we end the. Uh, end the hey, and I have a quick question for Sophie. Yep. 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 All right, Sophie. I noticed on your IMDb that you were in a film called Health Nut Forever. I was. I own a health food store. So, what's it about? <laughs> uh, it's not really about. It's it's a superhero. Um, saga that uh, Anthony is also the producer of. Um, it's the third installment of um, a kind of short, uh, a series of short films um, about superheroes. Um, I just don't want to give too much away, but I play a very exciting villain called Pamela. Um, it was super fun to, um, she was so much fun to play and the film's on YouTube. So... Oh. It's available for everyone. But it's not about health food? Is it about is it anything about any nothing? No. In a little way, but I, I don't want to give away too much okay. without no, fair like, enough. Right. <laughs> Watch all three. They're great. They're super fun, super funny. Um and also, you know, just really, really sweet, heartwarming um superhero series. Cool. Um, I have a superhero called Health Nut, who is um basically kind of trying to to train his successor um and runs into the obstacle of of various villains over over the course of the series sounds like a superhero for your store steve i'm <laughs> gonna have to check it out okay definitely <laughs> check it out on YouTube. yeah steve is broadcasting from a health food store right this minute yes i'm <laughs> in the store <laughs> so. that's that's how committed he is Yes, yes, he is. All or right, so, so all right, let's make play sure, a game. Well, hold on, wait, make sure to also go to Facebook, Cali Movie, C A L L I E M O V I E. Uh, and then, uh, same thing with Twitter, it's at Cali Movie. Uh, if you want to catch up, what's that? And Instagram. And Instagram. And Instagram. All right, fantastic. All right, so let's, let's do that, Mike. Let's play a game. I'm going to hit the game thing here. And I'm going to say, gonna hey. This. Everybody, it's game time with the Mythwits. I'm your game master, Peter Bryant, and on this episode, we're playing Tagline Madness. I'm going to give you a tagline from a movie. I will also give you two movies to choose from. You must pick which movie this tagline is associated with. For every answer you get right, Mike will give you one point. Every movie came out during the 2000 to 2011 time frame. So basically, these are these are taglines that would have been either in a commercial or a movie poster or somewhere where they said, you know, uh, the Terminator, he'll be back or whatever. What, I don't know. I don't know whatever it was. Terminator's not yeah. in this because it's old. So, uh, <laughs> so let, let me do that. All right. Yo, so, you, you remember the Terminator, Sophie? 
Oh, I do. Well, I do yeah, come on. Okay. Even hey. even the youngest people know the Terminator. I, I got in trouble for thinking that someone younger would know who the Incredible Hulk was. So I don't they might know. notice. 2000 to 2011. You see? Yes. Yeah, I hear you. See you. what I did there? Okay. How old were you in 2000, Sophie? Three. Three. All right. But this you. But these are movies you could have seen, and and. I have and, brothers. I watched. The, I watched the Terminator. I've seen it. Okay. All right. So Terminator's not in. That's too old. So all right, anyway. All right. So here we. A bunch of crap before when I ran the game. They I know. Here we go. Here, <coughs> Mike. <coughs> here we go. It's not about you. <laughs> all right. So I, uh, Sophie, being that you're our guest, I'm, I'm going to make the other two go before you, so that you, you know, so that you you can you ease into this much more comfortably. That's how we do things here. So I'm going to start with Mike. Mike is going to go first. <laughs> all right, Mike. Your first quote. Okay. Or not quote, sorry. It's not a quote. It's a tag. Movie line. tag, yes. Okay. Grab life by the ball. Is that, oh. is that oh. from Dodgeball, a true Dodgeball. underdog story, or... Do Dodgeball. 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 Mike? That is correct. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Steve, you're next. Oh, get this. Okay, Steve. Your tagline is there are 3.7 trillion fish in the ocean. They're looking for one. Is that Big Fish from 2003 or Finding Nemo from 2003? Finding Nemo. Steve, that is correct. Man, maybe this is easier than I thought. All right, Sophie. Now I'm going to give Sophie the really hard one to watch. Okay. Uh, oh, no. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. This, it's random. Um, all right. So, Sophie, here's your quote or tagline. God damn it. Tagline, tagline, tagline. 12 is the new 11. Is that from Ocean's 12 in 2004 or Cheaper by the Dozen in 2003? I'm going to go with Ocean's 12. Sophie, that is correct very nice so we that got three a, points I, across the board I would have that one. that's the only one i would have needed that for okay all right mike yes i'm hoping this one's gonna be a little harder a romantic combi a combi a romantic comedy with zombies is that Shaun of the dead in 2004 or zombie land 2009 <laughs> Go with Shaun of the Dead. Mike, that is... <laughs> I don't is... know why, but... Correct! All right. Steve. Okay. Oh, this one's hard. Okay. An <laughs> epic of epic epicness. <laughs> is that Napoleon Dynamite, 2004, or Scott Pilgrim vs. the World, 2010? I have to act like this is hard, right? Okay, yes. Oh, man. Oh. Uh, <laughs> oh. Which one do you think it is, Steve? What do you oh, think, yeah. Sophie? What Does do he think, have Steve? the chops? Does he have the chops <laughs> to be an actor? That's what I want to know. <laughs> so what'd you say, Steve? Napoleon Dynamite. Steve, that is... Sorry, buddy. Ah. That's Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Yep. There you go. All right. All right. We got one off. Okay. All right. So, Sophie, yours is... See our family and feel better about yours. Is that the Simpsons movie 2007 or the Royal Tenenbaums 2001? The Royal Tenenbaums? Yeah. Is it that or the Simpsons? I'm going to go with the Royal Tenenbaums. I think I'm wrong. I'm going to go with the Simpsons. Simpsons? Is that your final answer? Simpsons. Okay. Simpsons. Okay. That is correct. Nice. Nice save, right? Nice save. I hear it because I love the world ten of bounds and it would never have had that tagline. <laughs> okay. All right. <laughs> Epa, All right Mike. Epa. Mike, yeah. when you can live forever, what do you live for? Is that Twilight from 2008 or Final Destination from 2000? I know this one. <laughs> All right. Uh, I'm going to go with... Uh, the, the the twilights because uh i don't know uh the final destination is all about them dying so i can't see them living forever What's so the about them cheating death right they're cheat death but they're still being hunted by death 
Right. So, that, so Twilight, based on that, Twilight is my final answer. Mike, that is correct. <laughs> Man, you guys are killing this. Oh, the other way, Mike. Remember I was talking about the other way? You guys would not be killing this. No. It would have been so hard. Because the hey. other way... Oh no! I was gonna say what the what you could do is pepper in easy and hard ones, but you could also have it so that two points for getting it without the, okay. the, the Steve. choice. But <clears throat> right, so Steve. He, yeah. <laughs> he hates when I he hates my ideas. All right, Steve. <laughs> okay. Nothing spreads like fear. Is that Jeepers Creepers two thousand one or Contagion two thousand eleven? I have no friggin' idea. Like I'm gonna go with Contagion because Contagion spread. <laughs> yep, Steve. Well, that is correct. I would have concurred. Good All choice. Right. All, right, All right, Sophie. Yep. We've sensed it. We've seen the signs. Now it's happening. This one's gonna be a little tiny bit tricky. Maybe I don't know. Maybe not because it's either the happening from 2008 or it's. Signs from 2002. Hmm. Can I have the tagline one more time? Yes. Yeah. We've seen it. We've seen the signs. Now it's happening. Ooh. Gonna go with the happening. The happening is correct. Good choice. I, I would have concurred. Hey, by the way, Signs is one of the movies I hate the most. Of all time ever, I hate. Yeah, that didn't movie. you and I go and see that? We walked out very angrily. Like, no, I we saw it movie. separately because I went and oh. saw it with Camille and some people because they had tickets or something for it. And even when it was free, I was pissed off when I came yeah. out. I'm, I was angry. I've never come out of a movie <laughs> angry before. I came out of it angry. <laughs> you done me dirty, M Night. <laughs> you did really bad. All right, Mike. All right. Uh, but can I just one. give you at the end of uh, three rounds? It is uh, myself with three points, Steve with two points, and Sophie with three points. All right. Here's the last round. All right. Laugh, cry, share the pants. Is it <laughs> Z- Zoolander 2001 or The Sisterhood of the Traveling Pants from 2005? Laugh, cry, share the pants. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> sisterhood of the traveling pants right. or Zoolander. I'm going to go with the old sisterhood of the traveling pant alones. That is correct, Mike. Right. All right, Steve. Uh, no actual Europeans were harmed in the making of this film. Is that? Oh damn! You know, I want to watch. I don't want to watch that movie. <laughs> <laughs> is that Euro Trip two thousand four or Johnny English two thousand three? Euro Trip. That is correct. I would have gone with, yeah. All right, Sophie. Here's the last one. Okay. The greatest fairy tale never told is that Monsters Inc. two thousand one or Shrek two thousand one. Shrek. That is correct. Very good. All right. Uh-oh. So, no, nope, it's not a death over time. Nope. Nope, Mike, because what's the rule? If we have a tie and the tie guest is in that tie, the, yes. tie goes to the guest. Sophie, you get. <laughs> yes. We have our winner. Yes. Good job, Sophie. Good job. Fantastic. No, good you guys job, killed it. Sophie. You, you guys, job. you all did a fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful job. Fantastic. I, I was originally going to make it so that you had to tell me what the movie was, No Choices. And yeah. uh, I was looking at him like, there's no way. <laughs> there's yeah, no, no way. We're going to make one no point. There's no way I would have that. <laughs> right. No, not at all. So I think this was good. All right. Fantastic. Okay. Let me close that out. That's a good one. I like that. That's a good game. Yeah. Right, madness. We'll keep put that one in the, in the win column. All right. Fantastic. So, so before you close everything out, can I, yes. can I tell Sophie something? So sure. A, I wanted to interject earlier, but we were running short on time. Okay. Okay. You're. Do you ever see the movie Hugo? Yes. Okay. So you know the the movie's about uh, George Melius or Melius. I, I pronounce his name horribly, and it talks a bit about the Lemire brothers. But do you know who made more films than George, and she made almost a thousand more than him? No, I don't. 
Her name is Anne Guy Blachet. She's actually the first female filmmaker. And in her time, she made well over a thousand movies. Wow. About 300 of them are still around today. And she is, she is the creator of modern cinema in and of her own right. Hmm. But George Millais got the credit for it because his films, you know, for whatever reason, they just got yep. seen by more, you know. Um, World, World War I destroyed so much of these films. Yep. Many of them were just wiped out, you know, That's unfortunately, because these yeah. were all filmed in the late 1800s or right around the turn of the century. Hmm. And wow. that that yeah, so cellulite was made with nitrogen, that. and it went up like a any time it, it got by a flame, it just that's it. I remember yeah. that. And oh, many that, of those old oh. films were melted down to make plastic toys, shoes, various other things. <clears throat> yeah! Wow. Yeah. Wow! 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 That's All right. And now you know, and knowing's half the battle. Now, but but that is the kind of stuff that happens all the time. It's exactly what Sophie's talking about, right, Sophie? Yep. Yep. All right, everybody, let's do the closer. Oh, I'm showing too much stuff. I'm showing secrets in the room. All right, here uh -oh. we go. Uh, <laughs> all right, everybody, you have just enjoyed another awesome episode of The Myth Wits. We're live on Facebook Mondays at 9 p.m. Eastern Time. Please ask our guests questions like Jonathan did. Uh, or just banter with the other Mythfits. If uh, you miss our live show, you can always catch the Encore episodes on Facebook or on YouTube. Find us on Facebook and Twitter as Mythwits, and check out Mythwits.com. If you don't have time for videos, make sure to subscribe to our podcast via your favorite podcatcher, or you can just listen at Mythwits.podbean.com. Do the like, follow, subscribe thing wherever it's appropriate, and make sure to share your favorite episode on social media to help spread the Mythwits love over the entire planet. Hey, maybe it's this episode right here. Mythwits is part of the TSR Podcast Network. Check out TSRPN.com for more cool shows. Mythwits is also a Creative Commons product. Like and share it in all the places. Just don't edit it, don't sell it, and uh, don't take personal videos with it. Uh, make sure to check out Studio27.com for more cool stuff and join our mailing list. Thanks everybody for listening. Tell your friends to tune in. And until next week, Mike? Who said this? I'm getting a vibe that someone died. Was that Macaulay Culkin or the Hollywood Medium? Oh, God, it was that goddamn Hollywood Medium, wasn't it? Ah, <laughs> oh, I hate him. I hate him! <laughs>